In the spirit of reconciliation, Grab the Trace acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Welcome to another episode of Grab the Trace, a home design podcast to help you deliver your next project to its full potential. We're your hosts, Michaela and Lachlan, and if you're looking for some tips and secrets for your next project, be it building a new home, renovating, or even just picking what window furnishings would best suit your space, we have you covered. Whilst we'll try to help as much as possible, this podcast is of a general nature and won't be able to take into account your individual circumstance. If you need personalised advice, you should engage a relevant professional consultant to help make the best decisions for your situation. This episode, we're discussing storage and linen cupboards, as well as study nooks. So stick around, pull up your plans, and let's grab the trace. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Grab the Trace. Before we delve into kitchens, we wanted to touch finally just on our final interior space for the moment. We thought it'd be a good idea to run you through some storage, linen cupboards, and some study nook little secrets and hacks, if you will. We'll take you through what they should look like, what decisions need to be made, and what you can do to maximise your space. Michaela, how are you going today? Good. How are you? I'm very good. Another week. It is. Um, another another week episode done. of the podcast. Yeah, I'm so excited for this one. This is like, I feel like the underdog of the house. It is. I think it's something, and I know, <laughs> you know, I was going to pitch you this was, if there's one thing that sells a house, it's not the kitchen, it's not your bathroom, your ensuite, it's your linen your storage cupboards and your study nooks. Storage. Just I was thinking for we could me, just, storage. I was thinking we could rotate that through every week we do. And we could do, you know what sells a house to me? <laughs> Mudrooms. Mudrooms are where the money is to be made. And then oh. we can just keep rotating it through like that. True. I guess you can argue that every single space that we're going to be like, oh, mudrooms. Well, that's just storage for, you know. It's storage, all storage for muddy shoes. Yeah, muddy shoes, kids' school bags. It's just storage, wardrobes, storage for your clothes. Kitchen, storage for your kitchen goods. Like it's all just- I love that. Storage, storage is the world. Now, before we get into our fun little segments that everyone's growing to love, we do want to reach out and just say thank you for listening. Thank you for the engagement. We've, I think completely unexpectedly, we've crossed over 300 total downloads now. And when you're listening to this in two years time and we're multi-thousand listens, <laughs> multi it's going to be, yeah, you know, listens. we're going to be in the single digit thousands. You're going to be like, you guys don't even know what was coming. <laughs> but at the moment, this is pretty amazing. I guess that something that didn't exist two months ago has built a a consistent audience and we thank everyone for listening and everyone who's interacting with us on our socials. Yeah. It really um, does mean the absolute world to us. It it yeah, it's, keeps it, us going week to week. It's something nice and especially all the people we're reaching out to with our uh inspiration grams as well. We're getting a lot of really good interaction and kind of uh a bit of a dialogue going with a few of the people that we're we're highlighting or a few of the projects we're highlighting. So keep that coming. We love to to get those little messages and I think one of the things we're mainly happy about is I'm getting a lot of comments from friends and family who listen, who are kind of looking at some of these projects and saying, I didn't even know that was possible or how amazing is that look? And kind of everyone's building their own design vernacular or vocabulary by being able to look at some of these things and go, oh, I can, I know what that is now, or I can put that in my pocket. And maybe if I'm doing something in the future, I can bring that out in my own project. As well as design professionals, we're always looking at you know, the best in the best or the best in the business and kind of taking inspiration from that. But it's nice to be able to expose those projects and those designers and those architects to, you know, our friends and our family and our listeners. Completely agree. Yeah. And it's just, it's a nice way of actually looking at projects, I think, from a different perspective and being able to appreciate it just for what it is and how beautiful these spaces are. Yeah, I, I agree. And even to go further, I think it's beneficial for us. Like it's almost a little bit of forced homework to see what's going oh, on in the don't industry. Say homework, keep, then I yeah. won't like it. <laughs> it's 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 a way for us to keep our finger on the pulse, I guess, in terms of 
what everyone else is doing because we kind of get in our own little bubble. pigeonhole of what we're working on sometimes. You don't really see what's happening outside of that bubble. So Agreed. it's it's really nice to be able to see some of these projects and, yeah, the amazing people who work on them. I think it's probably a great time to kick off and just jump straight into it. Into Would you our- like to go first for our inspiration gram for this week? Absolutely. I have a beauty again, as always. This one is from the amazing architects, Adam Kane Architects, and in particular, their project, The Walnut House. I'm going to get, I'm, I'm literally going to show Lockie all of these photos and- Oh my goodness. It's definitely This is a classic Michaela pick. It is. It's it's understated. It's very, very simplistic. Wow. And such a small palette used consistently and cohesively. It's obviously been called the walnut house because the primary finish is beautiful walnut cabinetry and joinery, which they've actually got custom made. Shivers. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's be- sorry, I'm watching Lachlan just drool over all of Even these Even from photos. an architectural <laughs> point of view, this is this is a feat. This is stunning. Yeah. The, when you're looking at the photos, you'll see what I'm talking about, but the LED strip light running along the peak of the roof oh, or the ceiling space. Isn't it stunning? I wonder how it goes for lighting. Yeah, th- there's multiple photos with it turned on and turned off and you can I, – I will upload, obviously, so you can all have a look and have a oh, sticky peek. Even peak. the bathrooms are stunning. Yeah, it's it's just beautiful. So the main finishes are these beautiful polished concrete floors, but it looks like it's it's been like burnished almost. So it's a quite a dark dark charcoal color, and he's got these beautiful burnished like it's just the way it hits the light and reflects. And then they've got you know all of this same beautiful timber veneer joinery everywhere they've done the bed heads out of it they've done all the living room joinery they've done the kitchen obviously and then they've just framed each of these panels out in just the simplest panel work detailing they've used this one consistent beautiful stone in the kitchen island in the living room for the you know the fireplace hearth and the facade they've used it in the powder room basin they've used it in the bathrooms they've just used it everywhere and honestly it's just it's so simplistic and so minimal it might not be to everyone's taste but it is it's just beautiful it's really timeless really stunning classic and just I find the perfect mix of architecture and interiors like they've it's just so holistic. You can't see it's where seamless. the archi- yeah. yeah, you can't see where the interiors have started and the architecture's finished. It's just it's blended perfectly. It's an important thing to keep in mind is when we're designing spaces, depending on who say you've got a, a design team and you've got the architect working independently to the interior designers or the other consultants. I think Mikhail's 100% right. If you don't have a cohesive team that's working together, it almost feels like someone's designing a shell that then you're transplanting an interior concept concept into. Mm. I've got a question for you. Mm. Out of that house, and this might be something we try and do in future inspiration grams, if you were to try and highlight maybe one or two things that people could do at home, not necessarily, yes, this exact kitchen, but- yeah. I mean, like, especially looking at those I, bathrooms. What do I the, pull from that project? Yeah, the vanity design for that bathroom, it doesn't necessarily look that complicated. No. But you can get that same look maybe with the a lower level of finish depending on your budget, but yeah. it'll still it'll still feel high quality. 100%. I think the main things that I would take away from this project that again anyone can replicate in their forever home, their renovation, their project build top five I would say is the raked ceiling detail we spoke about that on our building block episode but a beautiful feature raked ceiling like I think that's the key focal point in this in this living kitchen space another one is how they've used materials every single space there's like four materials that is it so you can kind of take that and use that as inspiration for your own build maybe you have you know a beautiful soft gray cabinetry color that you love Use that just like they've used the walnut veneer and just use that consistently. They've used one floor finish that they've followed through even into their bedroom, the living space, the powder rooms, bathrooms, one floor finish. Then they've used the one stone throughout all of their wet spaces and even the kitchen. And then if you look at the powder room design, it is very, very simplistic. 
but it's exactly the same as the island detail. They've just used the same materials consistently. They've got this beautiful focal point ceiling. They have the same tapware finish throughout. I know we haven't touched on this actually. Even in our bathroom episode, even our building block episode, and it's like it's a cardinal sin. I'm going out there. It's it's actually one of my like deadly sins. Mm-hmm. You can't commit. Oh, we should do that up as a like a little ebook. Yeah. <laughs> Michaela and Lachlan's seven deadly design sins. <laughs> this is right up and there. And it ends up being like about a hundred because we can't <laughs> stop. We keep going, yep, double doors are on there, they're out. <laughs> double cavity sliders, they're <laughs> out. <laughs> no, um, my pet peeve, I would call it. And don't get me wrong, there is, gosh, I could name... 10 of my favorite interior designers and architects and they've all done this this is just my personal preference so if if you're into it that's fine but for me mixing metals or tapware finishes throughout a home big no-no i don't want to see a chrome mixer in your kitchen and then a brush brass master ensuite and, and matte, then matte black in your laundry. And then matte black in your laundry. And then you go to the guest bathroom or the powder room and you've got gun metal or brush nickel. Like, no, absolutely not. Because again, we keep coming back to those building blocks and that building block episode where I say, you know, it's really important to get that cohesive finish throughout. So, you know, if you've got five different tapware finishes or even three different tapware finishes throughout your home, you know, what do you select for your door levers? What are you selecting for your focal lighting? What are you selecting for your window and door frames? Like all of these decisions need to be made holistically. All of these decisions need to be made, I think, at the beginning of a project or a reno or a build and then consistently followed throughout the design. I agree. I 100% agree. Is And it's something you're slowly being able to beat into me as a designer <laughs> is – Don't design in isolation. Even if you're thinking, oh, I want to redo my kitchen, take some extra time to think, if I redo my kitchen, am I going to create roadblocks for myself in the future? Potentially, I know it's out there, but what, what would my house look like if I wanted to add an extra bedroom on at some point in time? Does that mean that the kitchen that I currently have is still fine? Or does that then mean the kitchen that I'm going to do is then going to be compromised if I go to add this extra bedroom on because I need Mm. more space? So by designing in isolation and thinking, yep, I'm working on this particular powder room and I've seen these images and I've done a mood board up just for this particular space and I've got a different color tapware there, I feel like you're almost robbing yourself of the opportunity for someone to come in and, as we're saying, a simple palette that we've gone through with our mood board episode in terms of finding the images, distilling it down to what you actually want. I always find the best way to do this before committing. And again, all of these spaces that we're talking about are really expensive to fit out. So oh, yeah. our, our bathrooms and our kitchens, we don't want to get it wrong. So there's pressure. And when people are under pressure, they might- Choke. <laughs> well, they might go to what they feel is like a safe option because they don't want to rock the boat or- Again, they're designing in isolation because, oh, no, no, we're just doing the kitchen and then not thinking about the rest of the space. But my biggest, I guess, go-to, which is, again, as professionals, these this is what me and my team do as well on the daily basis. When we're making these decisions, grab a sample of any finish that you're willing to use, be it a tile, a stone, a cabinetry sample. And if all of those finishes look good together and they all have those same undertones, Again, we spoke about this on a previous episode. Yep, we had a question. Yep, if they're all pink toned or they all have a warm yellow undertone or they all have a cool blue undertone, you're already 90% of the way there of it. It's going to look good because all of those samples have the same undertone and they're all looking nice together. So guess what? In each individual space, they're going to look nice together as well. Agreed. So I completely and utterly deviated from I think that was important though. House. I think that was a yeah, I, agree. I think there's there's something in there someone at home will have listened to that and who knows maybe that 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 little bit we can even clip that as a little bit of a highlight I think that's a good just a a general rule to follow yeah is or well, you don't necessarily need to follow it, but at least have it in your mind and consider it I think even we spoke about this during work one day when it's actually harder to design a box than to design 
inside a box, if that 100%. makes sense. Like if, if you're given free reign and you have no idea, you're like, well, I know what I like, I, I know what I don't like compared to, okay, I love this stone and I love this cabinetry color. I'm going to make every other decision based off that. That's going to be easier. Build. 100%. Find some key finishes or some key selections that you love that you don't want to change and you can really easily build a scheme off that instead of trying to find a paint color that you love and trying to find a stone that you love or try and find a tile that you love. Find one or two key items and then build everything off that. Yep, I love that. Well, is that all you wanted to say about your lovely inspiration, Graham, for this week? Yeah, I think this is, again, a very understated, elegant, sophisticated space that just harmoniously blends architecture and interiors together so perfectly. I honestly think the photos that we upload will do the rest of the talking. I agree. For my choice this week, I've um, I've gone a little more... A little more, I guess, local in terms of where we're recording the the podcast in Brisbane. So my project for this week is called The Gosca House by an architecture practice called Anara Gorman Architects. This is a really, really nice house and it's purposefully designed for a family and their needs, which I think is something very important. If you are someone at home and you're looking to go and have a, a house or a design done up for you, have a look through this, read some of the the commentary that the the actual owners gave about their experience with the architect. I think it's it's a perfect example of not overbuilding as well. They could have expanded the floor plate to take up as much space as they wanted to, but they've showed restraint, which has allowed them to have things that we've talked about and we loved. Voids, huge fan of voids. There's even some examples here of like the double height void over the kitchen especially in a family context where you can kind of, everyone's still connected socially. So if you're cooking dinner and the kids are upstairs playing in their room, you don't have to kind of trump up the stairs and go and see them. You can kind of call out. It's a, it's a social kind of endeavor. The bathrooms are designed with a family in mind. It's, it's clean, it's simple, but it's got a little bit of something to it. And then that same palette kind of rolls through. The kitchen design rolls through, even some of the exterior design as well. Big thing I wanted to touch on this week is it's also got a pretty well integrated study nook um, next to the stairs. We'll talk about this later in terms of where you want study nooks located. From what I can tell, it's almost in a little a little pocket. It's not in a hallway. It's got its own space. So you're not having to walk behind people using it. By not being in a hallway, you're not having something we'll Thorough talk about space. later. You're not having chairs poking out something we'll talk about maybe another design sin to add to that book when we get to it but mm-hmm. this is stunning the the screening's beautiful giving you enough privacy whilst allowing you to see out clearly through it when you're going to an architect and you're kind of entrusting them with all these hopes and dreams you've got of what you want there's some key items in the brief there about connection to garden not wanting the, a house that's too large that's all that is all a designer needs to kind of run wild, let their creativity go and then present something back to you that you still then have multiple opportunities to amend and tweak and kind of uh, curate it to the view that you want. Mm, I think it's like a perfect project that highlights restraint. As I said, Anna O'Gorman Architects were the, the designers behind it. We'll put it up on our Instagram and have a look at it. That brings us to the end of our inspiration, inspiration gram. Thank you very much. Let's do some home hacks. I'll um I'll kick it off if you'd like. Yes, please do. So I was thinking about this when I was on my, my drive over here to record today. And I was thinking we've done a lot of internal ones. I might venture externally today and just talk about something that everyone's got and it's neighbors. And if you've got noisy neighbors, not necessarily in a bad way, but sometimes everyone has a party and it gets a little bit much what you can do to maybe limit the noise either from your neighbours or limit your noise to be a better neighbour to those surrounding you. So maybe look at introducing a, an extra layer of timber to your fence to create a double lapped fence or even look at introducing some landscaping in the form of some hedges along your boundary. What that's going to do is give you additional density that the noise has to travel through or from and that'll mean that, yeah, you hear less of the things you don't want to. That's all I wanted to do as my home hack this week was have a look at your your fencing and even your landscaping along your boundaries. All righty, Michaela, what knowledge bomb have you got for us this week? All right. It's probably it's probably something pretty small. It's not 
it's not revolutionary by any means, but maybe opening our listeners' eyes to different products, which I'm all here for. So this one is for our kitchen, or technically you could use it elsewhere, but you kind of want to invest in this one in those key spaces and those key areas. So we're talking about the kitchen islands, and a lot of people usually get very far down the line in terms of designing and thinking about how they're going to do these spaces. And then they try and use the space and it's all done and they go, oh, I wish I had power. How am I supposed to use my like mix master? We need to put a GPO on that island. We really do. I'm not, I'm not a fan of, I know everyone's probably seen them, but like, you know, the push up ones where it's like cut into the bench and then they push up. We might talk about this next week, but I I am genuinely curious to know what your (laughs) your preference is for power. And we're definitely Mm -hmm. going to talk about it in terms of power into side of gables and how you can facilitate that, because sometimes you'll get told that it's not possible, but there's a way. There's a way for everything. There is ways around it. So for me... There's a few options, but in terms of my house hack, this one is a brand called Zeta. So Z-E-T-R, all capitals. Now what this is, is a flush oval shaped GPO, but they're either white or they're black and they are, they're relatively expensive. I'm not going to lie They're You're looking at like between two and three hundred dollars for a single GPO. However, the nifty thing about these are they're obviously oval shaped, which I mentioned, but they are completely flush and recessed into whatever material or to whatever surface you're mounting it. So again, it can be flush with plasterboard, how it's typically used or why you wouldn't invest so much into these GPOs is in your island. If you've got beautiful waterfall gables, I suggest one of these GPOs these Zeta GPOs recessed into the side of that stone waterfall gable. And honestly, it just looks so pretty and so stunning. I will actually upload a few photos of some examples on our Instagram and they've done it into timber cabinetry. They've done it into stone. They've done it into seamlessly into plasterboard walls. They've done it into, you know, custom bed head joinery. They've, they've kind of used it everywhere, but I would typically specify and use it for islands and more importantly into stone so i think that's that's my little beautiful little hack and you can also get usb gpos with it as well which i'm a big fan i've got so many questions for you with you know hang on we'll save it for when we talk about it because you might even put one of these zia gpos in your study nook so we'll save it for that part yes so speaking of that let's begin with our storage slash linen cupboards the reason i'm grouping them together is Usually they're pretty much going to be the same thing. There's some slight differences in terms of maybe your storage cupboard is doing a little more heavy lifting on the utility side of your home. Um, But your linen cupboard is generally just going to be for storing your bed sheets, maybe a sneaky vacuum in there as well. We'll see how we go. Or three. Or three, exactly. (laughs) With our storage in our linen cupboards, Michaela, Mm -hmm. same questions that we've got for the others or that we've run through for the other rooms and areas. What is your preference between a built-in, when I say built-in- A cupboard. uh, Essentially imagine a very small room, it's got plasterboard walls, and it's just got a normal hinge door on it. We're not talking about anything joinery, because then that's the the next option is you've got a built-in one. A lot of project homes do that. You've got joinery or cabinetry, which is your more bespoke option. A lot more customization there. You can kind of tie it in with the other big elements in your home. Or the one that we love the most- If you can incorporate a walk-in linen or a walk-in storeroom- You're a king. You're a king. You're a king amongst men. A walk-in linen or storeroom, especially with some houses these days getting smaller, is very important because finding enough storage, especially when we're designing places, we think, yeah, that's enough. But if you provide more, it's just going to give the end user, not even just the initial end user, but the, those going forward, it just allows them to plug in and then they don't have to go and necessarily get a storage unit that they're never going to use the things in for a couple of years. It just, it gives people more flexibility. Yeah. I think in my entire experience or in my entire career, I don't think once I have ever ever heard a client be like, there's just too much storage. No, there's a tangible value to it as well. So if you're building a home with storage and as long as you do it in a responsible way, 
And the keyword is responsible because you can overdo it. There is value to that. 100%. You can increase the value of your home by offering more storage or at least considered storage. Yes. And I think every home needs to have different types of storage. And I think obviously this is what this episode's all about and we'll go into what other types of storage are usable, be that vanity storage, walk-in linen, cupboards, or just utilising each space or trying to blend spaces. So there's no such thing as just a blank hallway. You can integrate storage into every space and it can be multi-purpose. It can be used for your laundry if it's right outside the laundry. It can be used for towels if it's near the bathroom. It can be used as a playroom in a media room for the adults, but then during the day it's the playroom for the kids. Like, and all of this can house toys along with electrical gear. Like Every single space needs to have storage of some sort. There's always an opportunity to add some form of storage. And as we're saying, you're never going to regret doing it. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Going on from that, with our cabinetry storage, for instance, how deep do we need to go with this? What rules or what guidance can you give for us there? All right. So obviously each storage has its use or its purpose, I would say. So if we're looking at like vacuum, mops, buckets, broom, cupboard, or we're even looking at somewhere to put like the laundry basket, 600 minimum. So very, very similar to our wardrobe storage. So I talked about our cabinetry depths in our wardrobe episode. So if you haven't already listened to that, by all means, it's please a banger. go back. Check yeah. it. It's the episode before this one. And that just gives you enough clearance to obviously have a beautiful door on it. Be that if it's a like a joinery door, if we're doing a built-in joinery unit, or if we're just doing like a built-in cupboard with like plasterboard walls and a semi hollow core door and a dummy handle, then I'd still say 600 clear from the inside of the door to the rear of the wall or the rear of the cabinet. Then in terms of towel or linen storage, I actually think a little shallower than that. So I would always recommend like between 450, 500 is really nice, but 450 is still really usable. That's going to give, I always find like if you double layer, like don't get me wrong, if you've got the space and you can fit a 600, by all means go 600 everywhere. If you're limited on space or you'd rather give it back to the adjoining room, 100% I would. I always find if you double stack linen, you end up forgetting about what's in the pile behind it and you only ever, yes, you yes. Only ever use like the sheets or the towels that are in the front row. Yeah, the showpiece. The stars. Yeah, the stars. Of the show. <laughs> so I always find... Again, unless you're one of the select few who are OCD, like a few people I know, you're not going to be spring cleaning every month or two and doing a huge wardrobe clean out and a huge linen clean out and a huge towel like clean out. I always find if you're constantly rotating and looking at what you own and making sure that you're updating your storage... I would actually prefer a shallow and less storage and it's well-maintained than yep. have cupboard for days and you don't even know what's at the back of it and you haven't seen it in years. So I always recommend, yeah, 450 for linen, 600 for a broom cupboard or 600 across the board if you are so inclined. Yeah, I agree. Something we've got in our linen cupboard as well that is sometimes a good thing to, you just have nowhere else to put is sewing machines are pretty big. It's just those things you don't really use that frequently. So maybe do an inventory of what you've got at home and yeah, cut, physically yeah. kind of map it out and go, at worst case, can I store this in the back of someone's wardrobe or should mm -hmm. this be, should it have its own space? Storage is so unique to the owner there. So as you said, like as Lockie mentioned, sewing machine, I've got like a massage table that you would be like, where the heck? Massage table? A massage table. I used to do beauty. Yeah. Um, so like that needs to go somewhere. And guess what? A 450 deep or even a 600 deep cupboard. That it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit it. I think the biggest one that was eye-opening to me in terms of storage was, again, I think I've mentioned a million times, I'm the youngest of six. So being the youngest, all my elder siblings all have kids and watching them transition from, you know, my kind of age with single life to family life, their house needs to accommodate. So I just didn't realize how much stuff you need and then you need to store 
for kids. So like all the prams and the car seats and the jolly jumpers and like oh my goodness, everything. And all of those things are oversized. Like where do where does the average person fit all this stuff? Like I it blows my mind. So let's design in some cupboards that will accommodate that. So as Lockie mentioned, do an inventory. Find out what you need and then accommodate your storage for that. You know what? I don't think in our wardrobe segment we touched on this, which is a bit crazy. We didn't mention, you know, I call it the old school way, but this is what I grew up with. The built-in wardrobes or the cupboards that are just semi-holocore doors, they have a dummy lever on it, and it's just all plasterboard walls Mm -hmm. internally, and then you've got, you know, your shelf and your hanging rail. But they're usually a lot deeper than, say, you know, the prefab Ikea cabinets. They're only like, what, 580 deep? But those built-in wardrobes, like I had one growing up that was like maybe 800 deep. Yep, yep. That's where you put all of your oversized items. But if you had fully built-in cabinetry from Ikea, where are we going to put that? We need to design that in. We can do built-in linen cupboards just like we would built in wardrobes and that's where we get our extra deep storage you know you yep. can you know we say 600 for a broom and a mop cupboard but let's do 800 oh it's the minimum when we were talking about bathrooms and the sizes there this is the the minimum we would work with anything on top that's just icing on the cake that's just beautiful that's everything we want my next question for you is are we just limited to open shelves or should we look at adding drawers to say we are, I think that's probably the best mindset to be in is with the cabinet tree. Mm-hmm. Should we be adding drawers in there or is there, what's well, your thoughts? Well, actually I, in my first reno, we did this like butler's pantry slash laundry and we had all of our linen, like we had like a walk-in linen within that. Sounds a bit of a convoluted space, but it was a multi-purpose space. And I invested in Ikea built-in cabinets. As I said, I did all Ikea. But we did two double door cupboards with open shelves above and then drawers below because I've seen so many, so many hints and tips being like, oh, it's so much better linen storage if you do drawers underneath and you can fit so much more. I actually regret regretted it really uh, yeah i know i know i i honestly would have preferred all open shelves and all adjustable because obviously drawers are fixed heights so you're limited with what you can fit in there and yes it's great that obviously any drawer storage and i'll go into this in our kitchen episode drawers are obviously better storage outcomes because obviously you're not having to bend down reach at the back of a cupboard all of that storage is coming out and bring to it to you, you. yeah it's way more accessible however it is limiting because a drawer is fixed so you can't adjust the height of that drawer you can only fit what fits in the height of that drawer if that makes sense so giving yourself the ability to do adjustable open shelves you can fit all the doona covers you can fit all extra pillows. You can take out some shelves and fit in, make it into a broom cupboard. You can adjust it as you see fit and your storage needs are going to change over the years as well. So your storage options also need to be adaptable. If this is going to be your forever house, it needs to be adaptable for you and with you. Agreed. Following on from what we were talking about last week with our walk-in robes and our wardrobes as well is if the budget isn't there, just spend prioritize the things that you're going to see most frequently. So your handles and your door fronts, prioritize those. The carcass internally can be just as cheap as you can get it because it's going to be covered by things, whether it's linen, uh, like all your towels and stuff, or whether it is your sewing machine is going to sit in front of there. So don't stress out too much about that. That's It just needs to be functional. Because these things aren't meant to be kept open. So when the door's closed, if you look at it and go, oh, gee, I really like that, that's all that matters. That's all that matters on that front. So the other question I had, and I'm I'm not sure if we did talk about this last week, was if you've got the ability to have a cupboard with shelves in it that you would always prefer to have the ability to have that adjustable rather than have fixed Mm -hmm. shelves built in. I will will always opt for adjustable. So when we say adjustable, just in case um, anyone at home doesn't know what we're talking about, is when you look at the side of a, like your cabinet, when you see all the little pinholes where you get the little um, shelf supports that you can slide in, that's what we're talking about. So IKEA, they they sell their pack system and it comes with that built in, those pinholes. Bunnings, they sell their cheap carcasses. You can either get it as a solid panel or for like 
I, I don't even think it's that much more. It's maybe like $3 more a panel. It has all of them pre-drilled in there. You don't have to use them. I will tell you, it is a lot easier to buy them with the holes than buy them without and then have to then go and later add the holes. Y- yes. That sucks. Keep it adjustable because it might, as we're saying, it might not necessarily be for your needs, but your needs are going to change over time or someone coming in and maybe buying your house or renting your house. It just makes their life easier. So Yeah. Um, another little hack as well that I really want to mention is, again, with the IKEA and our wardrobes, I talked about, you know, building wardrobes or in this case, linen up on a plinth, building in the carcass, putting on the simple white doors from IKEA, investing into some beautiful hardware, joinery handles, putting the skirting along the bottom, putting the architraves around it, making it look fully built in, but you can control that. So when you're looking at floor plans or renovating or your project builds, do your bit of research, go on the IKEA website, look at their packs systems because they're probably the cheapest I did yeah like their kitchen carcasses are a lot more expensive than the wardrobes and the wardrobes actually go up higher so I highly recommend the wardrobes but again a little hack that we did in our master like sweep again I I think I spoke about a bit of the layout that we've got so we've got like a separate walk-in robe a separate bedroom a separate powder room and a separate ensuite but what this does is it's got like a central corridor in that central corridor I actually did a 300 deep Pax wardrobe carcass and it's like a double door it was so cheap i think it was like a hundred bucks for the yeah. for the Pax 300 deep it, it's nearly unbeatable on price to the point yeah. where i've um i had to cut like custom door widths because the one of the spaces in our house like the Pax comes in like 500 750 or a meter wide increments and we had a space that was like 960 and it's so cheap that it was more cost effective for me to have to buy the doors twice because I stuffed up cutting them the first time <laughs> than it would have been to even just get the carcass from um maybe a, a, like a custom carcass made up for the whole thing. It's just, it's mm, one of the it's best value for money yep. things we're onto. And it's one of the things that, again, I will never regret storage. And I love, love, love having, it's just 300 deep. It's not, it was just this little kind of leftover nook space that worked with our layout. And I got a double door, a meter wide, 300 deep. And I put all of our linen in there. I put all of our like candles and all my extra bits and bobs. And it's honestly, it's so usable. And I'm so, so glad I did it. And that's just one example of just, a hallway that I utilized storage in. So you can do that for your linen cupboards. You can do it in the entry of your home, in a mud room. You can do it in laundry as a linen cupboard. You can do it in, you know, av- like normal hallways within the living space of, of your home. You can do it in the front of your island. You don't have to go, you know, every time we think of linen, we're thinking, you know, 2100 or 2.4 high we can just do 900 high you can stick that underneath your island bench you can pop it in under your entertainment unit like you can put storage anywhere and everywhere once a door's on it who knows what that's concealing agreed fan of ikea in terms of their storage potential Yeah, yeah it's just a really easy way to integrate storage and you can kind of do it yourself and in the planning stages of a reno or a house build, you can get the builder to obviously form all of these plasterboard provisions, if you say, and plaster it up. And then you can come along later and fit it yourself. Yeah. And you just tell them to do it in the increments of 500 or a metre. And yep. then you can maybe give yourself a little bit of tolerance. But yeah, it, it just makes it so easy to just slot them all in. Yep. Highly recommend. It's great. So just on that little hack as well, if you do, you know, build the baseboard up, create a bulkhead above it, obviously your builder is going to need to know exact measurements. I always add like 10 mil to that provision. So if you're putting in a meter packs unit, do a meter 10 clear and you'll be fine. You can cover that with the the architrave because again, you're putting those beautiful architraves all the way around it. If you've got a little bit of a gap, it's easier to to conceal a gap than it is to make it bigger. So yeah, agreed. In terms of lighting and power, if you if you're doing a walk in space, we'll do a just a simple downlight in the the kind of center of the circulation space is sweet, and then we'll look to maybe integrate some LED strip lighting so you can see what's on your shelves. Not at the back of the cupboard because then that's going to get clogged up and you're not going to be able to see anything. With your cabinetry stuff, what were you saying? We were saying you want that at the front of the cupboard 
potentially even on on a motion sensor or something. Yeah, I would do a sensor on the like the door. So you know the good old IKEA sensor mm. lights as well. And again, it's hard obviously if you've got it's only four hundred and fifty deep or six hundred deep. Like those shelves are going to be the full depth. So unless you're doing a sensor light on every single shelf, you're not really going to yeah. benefit from it. It's different for a wardrobe when it's kind of all open. Honestly, I think just a down light in a hallway is sufficient enough light. Yeah. To be able to try and center it over your storage. Yeah. So that way when your doors are open, you're not blocking you're not shadowing. the light yeah. a little bit. That that that's a good tip. And as we were saying, for power, if you're gonna be putting a, a vacuum charging station in there, sort that out. GPO. Another yeah. thing, yeah, another thing that sometimes gets put in cupboards, especially with apartment buildings, is Data. Yeah, well, yeah. sometimes that's where the like your little NBN box goes. So your modem or your your router where the internet's kind of being beamed around the apartment, you can put that in a more strategic place. But switchboards and NBN that kind of lives, has to live in a cupboard somewhere in an apartment. And so generally we'll do that in a portion of a storage cupboard and then that just makes it easy. And then you can put your lovely cabinetry door on it and then no one knows it's there until they open it up and there's a surprise. I think that's where we're going to leave at least our storage and our linen cupboards at the moment. I was talking to Michaela early today and we almost see this as a, a bit of a continuation of what we were talking about last week with our walk-in robe and our wardrobe designs in terms of they all share the same kind of finishes if you potentially even use some inspiration or the the rules that in Mikhail's inspiration gram from this week in terms of having a consistent palette more than likely the your your storage door fronts are going to be the same as your walk-in robe door fronts so you're kind of blending and yeah i oh, i probably do have like one little hack to add mm-hmm. to that or like one little tip and again our wardrobes or even our like walk-in robes and our masters or our bedrooms you know they could be a little bit more statement like yes i obviously gave the hack of just doing the ikea white wardrobe doors you've got the white architraves around it and then it's kind of more about the handles but in terms of our walk-in robes we do a lot of like timber look cabinetry in our masters so they can be a little bit different a little hack that I would really recommend and again this is dependent on your budget and what type of material palette you were working with however when we do a lot of two-pack cabinetry what I love to do in a lot of our projects is the same wall color I'll match the two-pack cabinetry colour to the door fronts. That is a massive tip. Yeah, for for our linen cupboards. And then even though we've got, you know, the beautiful architraves all the way around it, I'll actually potentially, if we're doing two-pack, I wouldn't do the architraves all the way around it. I'd actually keep it completely frameless. I'd square set that opening. Yeah, nice. Do a two-pack door in the same colour as the wall colour, which again is that slightly little bit darker because we're getting our contrast from our skirting and our doors. And then you could make it look like panel work. So instead of, you know, the the positives or the pros about going with a two-pack finish is you can do a formed cabinetry panel. So that's where you can get your shaker profile or any kind of profile door that you'd like. You know, you could do a whole wall that looks like panel work, but then these doors are actually all linen. And then instead of doing handles, you can just do a push to open mechanism. So that whole wall or the whole wall down a a beautiful hallway or underneath the staircase. It just looks like, yeah, it just looks like wall panel or it just, yeah, it just seamlessly blends in and you don't even have to notice it or see it. I love that for us. Let's move on to our study nooks or just general, if you're putting a desk in a bedroom, this is probably also a little, a little helpful segment for you. So as we talked about in my home hack. It looks like the the study nook for the kids or just the general family in that home has been designed at the not in a thoroughfare space has been designed out of it. So the benefits of that, I think we we maybe even touched on it slightly is there's nothing worse than having some of those study nooks where they're in a hallway or in a space that people are walking and especially if they're say you've you've got the edge of the desk in line with that wall because any chair that you've got is going to have to then sit proud of that. So you're immediately reducing the width of a hallway. Probably uh, it's even more salt in the wound if you've gone through the process of creating a hallway that's larger than usual, which is something else we fully endorse. And then you're losing, I don't know, 10, 15 centimeters because you've got a big office chair that's now sitting, the the kind of back supporter that is sitting out in your space. So let's keep it tucked in, even recessing it in. If it isn't a thoroughfare space, pull it in. So that way you can almost have someone fully pull out from their chair and still not intrude into that circulation space. That's ideal. 
but your mileage will vary in terms of how much you're going to lose to be able to achieve that. I just wanted to add a little thing on that. Sorry. In terms of, and I know we talk about this a lot during our floor plan design and our design process. And again, this potentially a little bit off topic from study desks, but I think it's like a golden rule. Again, one of our golden rules to live by. (laughs) Yeah, we'll have the the deadly design sins (laughs) and then the design commandments. (laughs) Yes. I think we did mention we had a design commandment in a previous one. I can't remember what it was though. Something great. Yeah, someone It's probably going to be this again (laughs) we've already talked about this (laughs) no i think one of the design commanders that we we should all live by is each area or each room or each space should be destination thanks insert i don't think the only purpose of a hallway is for thoroughfare space so there should be no destination areas in a thoroughfare or a transition space. So I'm a big fan and I know controversial, here we go, people come at me, open plan living when people are talking about like kitchen living dining and your dining room is kind of in between your living and your kitchen. Yep. That to me completely detracts from what a dining room should be. In my, maybe it's maybe it's the British, the UK coming through. Yeah, where it's a they, bit of snobbery for me. <laughs> but every room deserves or every space deserves a moment. And for me, it should be destination. So like, don't walk through your dining room. Don't walk through an NPR. Don't walk through a living room. Don't walk through a hallway and are greeted by your study. I think it should be, it deserves a destination. With our depths of our desks. Yes. 600 is, I think, too small. Agreed. The The only situation I can see 600 being okay with is if you're purely just using a laptop because it's that smaller form factor. But generally, I would like to shoot for larger. 700 would probably be your minimum. what I'd be willing. 750 maybe is why I'd be willing to sign off as my design minimum. But I mean, 900 is amazing. Having all that space to be able to like push everything back. Mm. Oh my goodness. I love it. I've got a, a pretty deep desk at work and it's fantastic. I, oh, I, I see. I am I think that's too much. You think it's too much? Because then it's like, oh, the dust collection behind the monitors. And then it's like- Oh, I just don't look. Well, or I'm just I'm maybe, oh no, I've got pretty good vision. I've got 20-20. But like when the monitors are just too far away- it feels a bit... Mm, but yeah. see, that's my... This is my inner tech snobbery because I've got those <laughs> monitor arms. I can bring them forward, but then I've so got then all that wide... real estate. Oh, my God, So I can, no. gra- I can grab the trace and draw things Ooh. underneath. I can shovel my... my. I can shuffle my little keyboard you forward. You said shove. There should be no shoving. Yeah, I nearly see? said shovel as well. Um, <laughs> I can... Yeah, I've just... I've got so much more room for activities. It's yeah. the Step Brothers method. See, for me, I think, honestly, a usable desk space in my opinion, is like the golden number is 750. 900 is ridiculous. That's an island. That's a, ki- that's a kitchen island. For all my tech guys and girls <laughs> out there, ignore what Mikhail is saying. No. 900 is to amazing. To me, the important dimension is the width of your desk. I feel like there's no point doing this 900 deep glorious and then it's just a metre wide. <laughs> it's a metre wide. And you're just like... It's deeper than it is long. <laughs> yeah, and you're like, you, you're stuck in like this little wedge. Yeah, like pigeonhole. When, yeah, that's not great. I would, rather, I would rather even just do a 600 deep and if it's two metres long, yeah, that's way more usable for me. Like that's the real estate you need, you know? Yep, love that. You know? What? Except, oh, sorry, just on that, when you said the only place applicable for a 600 deep is just for a laptop, but like, nooks in kitchens when you have a 600 deep bench continuing that and including like a little nook in like a little study nook for laptops or ipads or like your dumping ground i always call it like it's the keys and the mail drop off zone that's that's fine at 600 i think i think that's brilliant to incorporate you know a little extra nook a little bit of extra something yeah something i was going to ask you about was thoughts on people using their kitchen islands as a study and from your face I can immediately tell that your argument's probably going to be on ergonomics oh. and the fact that you're then having to hunch over because not the even, seating's no, not right. not ergonomics at all it's like I'm sorry are we eating or are you doing your homework like no kids get to the dining table if you want to do that like I'm yeah I'm all for that it's just a kitchen for me is like that's that's food prep yep so as food prep I don't want Nah. Height for your desks? 
750 high is 750. the ergonomic, like 900 high for your kitchen bench top, 750 for a study desk. Agreed. Or a makeup station as well. So I have seen a lot in wardrobes and master wardrobes, and we have done them a lot, makeup tables, and they also want an additional study nook in their wardrobe or in their master bedroom. So having that 750 high, you could do a two and a half meter long built-in bench, and then that could be your makeup and a study nook. And then it goes up to like a 900 high bench for a kitchenette. Who knows? Depth of the bench itself. If you're going a cabinetry um, even if it's just something nice and simple, like a bit of board with a laminate finish of it over the top, mm-hmm. I'm thinking 32 mils the minimum. 32 mil thick. To stop that yep. flex. If you can add a center partition, that's amazing, but that kills your leg room in terms of being able to kind of move around. Yeah, we we definitely want 32 mil thick. We don't want sagging. We It needs to be functional, just like you would do a 20 mil thick stone top. We need to do a 32 mil thick cabinet tree. So then I guess to to go on from that, and as we were saying for the the storage in the linen cupboards, you can take the same finishes that we've been talking about for our laundries, for our bathrooms that we will talk about for our kitchens, and you can apply them to the same area in terms of you might do a very nice stone top for your study nook or Mm -hmm. you might do a a cabinetry setup with some drawers on the side and that cabinetry is in this this joinery is in a cabinetry finish this two pack finish oh two pack yeah we've got two pack stone you can go malamine there's so many options you could do a solid timber you know a beautiful timber bench top you can just get from like bunnings and stain it yourself like so many options but yeah, I think the world's kind of your oyster when you think of any leftover little nook or space, be it under a staircase or in a kid's bedroom, in a master wardrobe, in, you know, there's so many areas where you can fit in a really usable space. Lighting and power, similar vein for the lighting, as we were saying, for the storage. Uh, if it's in a hallway or if it's just off from a hallway, just get a downlight centered over that general space, but you're going to need some task lighting, aren't you? Yeah. So again, a lot of even just offices or studies, you will have like a table lamp. I'm a little bit bougie. I love, love in little nooks, specifically in like under staircases or like in your inspiration gram this week or in a kitchen nook area. I'm all for a beautiful wall light, like a decorative Mm. bougie wall light. It just looks really nice and that can just be like a bit of a star. We talked about this at the start of the episode as well that we were going to come back to it now, but we're now realizing that we actually don't know the answer. But if we're putting our PowerPoints here and we suggested you include a, a USB charger to that, we might have to get someone to talk about what the way forward is. There's different types of USB in the world now. USB C might be the way forward now. Leave that with us. We might try and find someone to get the answer for that, but once again, whatever suits. Allowing for yeah a charging nook or charging drawer. Like we do it again, I'm sure we'll mention it in our kitchen, but I've integrated a lot of like charging drawers where there's actually like GPOs and USB points inside a drawer. You can easily access that or put that in the study nook. Again, we talked about the NBN or the data in our linen cupboards. If you have a specific area like this study nook, you can pop it in there. You can do a full height storage cupboard that can you know do all your a4 paper and your stationery yep. and all of that printer i don't know do people print anymore i do oh there we go okay. yep i'm old school yep. i guess you've got a sewing machine i do so. yeah i think that's pretty much it i mean yeah. there's there's more you can go into with all this but let's let's just keep it simple for now mm-hmm. i will say that get people thinking when we did our project home and if you're out there doing a project home they do include one double PowerPoint with a USB included somewhere that you get to allocate and we put ours in our study nook. There's probably not a week that goes by that I don't use that thing multiple times a week, whether it's charging phones, whether it's charging uh, Bluetooth headphones. And so it's just so convenient to just have something there. You don't need to go and find the wall brick to plug your USB. Quite underrated, I think. Mm. I think it's very, very useful. Everyone, that's going to wrap up where we are now. Before we hit the outro, we do want to just make sure that you all understand that the ride we're about to go on in the next couple of episodes. Buckle Because in. if you think that we love the spaces we've talked about to date, wait until we start talking about kitchens. So much so that we think at the time of recording this, it's going to be a three-parter. It could be more. I doubt it'll be less. 
Do you have a rough breakdown of how you want to approach it? Yeah, definitely. I think how we've been kind of tackling each of these spaces, we've been doing a really nice like overview and then including lots of hacks. What goes in that space? What are the materials? What are the palette? What are some little hacks? I think that's a great overview to start on. And then I I really want to dedicate a whole episode just on appliances. I think that's a very, I don't know, people not struggle, but they get a little bit nervous. It's a huge, huge thing. There's a lot of choices to be made. A lot of choices, a lot of different budgets, a lot of different cooks and how they use those spaces. So yeah, I think I want to do a whole episode just on appliances and then another one on just materials. Yeah, good Break, call. Breaking down what type of cabinetry options are out there, different budgets, what type of stones are out there. If you don't even have stone, you want to do timber or concrete or formed plaster or a tiled bench top. Like, Heaven forbid. There's so many other options. So I think a whole episode just on what materials you can use in this space would be Love huge. It. Let's get out of here. That brings us to the end of another episode. If you have any questions about what we discussed, feel free to reach out to us on either our Instagram at grabthetrace or our email via grabthetrace at gmail.com. If we can ask that you can subscribe and share the podcast on the platform you're listening on or leave a review or a rating on Apple Podcasts, that would be an enormous help to us and help us reach a larger audience. Our opening and closing music was created by Robert Helberg and Michaela. Thank you very much for your time this week. Everyone, thank you all for listening so much and we'll see you next time. See you next time, everyone.